Welcome everybody to tonight's presentation on the history of vestments. I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, and I'll say something about her right after our prayer. Uh, Claire Adamo will lead us in prayer. Go ahead, Claire. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. 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 Dear Lord, thank you for this time together to share on the remarkable history of vestments in the Catholic Church uh, what our priesthood and our deacons wear. Uh, we look forward to Dr. Tulin's talk. Uh, please let our hearts be open to all that she has to present. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, Claire. I'll begin very briefly. Uh, my name is Dr. Sebastian Mafud, and I am the Vice President of External Affairs at Holy Apostles College and Seminary and the Provost at the Sacred Heart Institute in Huntington, New York. To introduce Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson, uh, she is the Chief Academic Officer, as well as an online professor of Dogmatic and Moral Theology at Holy Apostles College and Seminary. She also hosts WCAT Radio's Author to Author, a program in which she interviews Catholic authors to assist Catholic readers in identifying Orthodox Catholic content. So uh, if you have the opportunity to listen to one of her radio shows, uh, you can do so at www.wcatradio.com slash author to author. Uh, she is the author herself of two uh, books. One is entitled The Story of Holy Apostles, which is about Holy Apostles College and Seminary. And the other is entitled Survivor, A Memoir of Forgiveness. Dr. Tulin Wilson's doctorate is in sociology from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst. After she converted to Catholicism in 1988, she earned a 90-credit MA in theology from Holy Apostles and a licentiate from Dominican House of Studies in Washington, D.C. You can read all about that in her memoir, Survivor. She has been associated with Holy Apostles for 32 years, 25 of which have been as an administrator and professor. She has been involved in the academic formation of well over 200 priests and hundreds of lay people and religious. I'm very honored to present uh, my dear friend, Dr. Cynthia Tulin Wilson. Thank you, Sebastian, for that uh, very nice um, introduction. Um, so tonight I'm going to spend uh, about a half an hour, uh, maybe a little longer, <clears throat> telling you about my interest in vestments and um, how, I, uh, how I am trying to live that out. Uh, a few more pieces of information about myself. Um, I am a mother, grandmother, great-grandmother, and I have over 30 descendants dispersed over four states. I divide my time between Vermont, where I live with my husband, and Connecticut, where I work at Holy Apostles. I've been interested in vestments for over 45 years. When I was not Catholic, <clears throat> excuse me, I had throat cancer, so sometimes my voice gives out. When I was not Catholic, I was invited by my then fiance, Jimmy Tulin, to the 1974 Christmas Midnight Mass at Saints Peter and Paul Cathedral in Providence, Rhode Island. I agreed to attend, and when I walked through the door, um, I was surprised by the number of people in attendance. I estimated that there were well over 1,000 people seated in the pews. Then I looked up at the altar and I was astonished by the beautiful but unusual looking clothing that the men on the altar were wearing. After Jimmy and I married, we went on vacation to Quebec and Jimmy said he wanted to go to an Ursuline convent museum. I agreed to go, although I was still not Catholic. As luck, or God's providence, I suspect it was God's providence, uh, would have it, the display in the museum was of antique handmade vestments on mannequins inside glass enclosures. So I walked around each enclosure and looked at all of these uh, beautiful vestments. I was really in awe of the beauty. 
And I mean, the material was so rich, the embellishments, the handwork. Um, it was really a tremendous experience for me that I still remember. Uh, Jimmy died in 2006, so he did not know my interest investments would grow or the part he had in it. Um, but he did see me to convert to see me convert to Catholicism in 1988. He and uh, one of my daughters were my uh, sponsors. My hobbies were then and continue to be crazy quilting and embroidering. So crazy quilting, uh, I'm not sure if any of you know about this, but it's a type of quilting that was popular in Victorian times in which beautiful fabrics, um, satins, silks, brocades, velvets, they're sewn together and then they're embellished with embroidery. So the vestments um, reminded me of the rich fabrics and the embellishments that I routinely used in my hobbies. So at that point, my interest in vestments was only because of their beauty. Years later, after I converted to Catholicism and became a professor of dogmatic and moral theology, I met a late vocation seminarian, David Wilcox, in one of my classes. He had made vestments for the Trappist priests in the Spencer, Massachusetts Monastery. With the permission of the Holy Apostles President Rector at that time, Father Douglas Mosey, David taught me about vestments and showed me the patterns for many of them. But more important than the technical information he gave me was a conversation we had one day. David told me, Every cut we make in the fabric, every stitch by machine or hand, every embellishment must be done with the utmost care because these vestments will be used in the holy sacrifice of the mass. I never forgot that. David steered my interest in vestments from their beauty to their beauty and their meaning. The difference between the profane and the sacred is so pronounced when I look at the vestments the proper way, because the sacredness of the vestments points me to the things of God. Over time, my competence in theology and my skills in handwork led to a more mature interest in vestments and their symbolism, history, and variety. And so here we are at the beginning of a five-week MOOC. And I thank uh, Dr. Mahfoud for making this possible. For this course, uh, I want to tell you that I rely very heavily on two works, although many others are cited in the lessons. The first is by Herbert Norris. He wrote a book, Church Vestments, Their Origin and Development, by Dover Publications in 2019. That book is absolutely excellent. Um, and anyone who's really interested in investments, I think, would enjoy reading it. It's almost uh, like a little encyclopedia. I also rely heavily on Ken Collins. He has a vestments glossary from the concise lexicon of Christianity. And um, I can give you the, uh, the website if you want, but you can just look up the concise lexicon of Christ Christianity. That is not solely Catholic. Uh, there is information in there about uh, many Protestants, um, but the point is that you can get information from that. There's also a very excellent article in the Catholic Encyclopedia, the old one, I think it was 1956, and uh, the article is called Clerical Costume. And I use that, and that's a really a very nice source. So having told you a little bit about myself, um, I want to start on the issue of clericals. So I know that this is a course in vestments, um, but in this first lesson, I'm going to give you some information on clericals. These are important to address because clothes and ornamentation signify the status of a person and the activity in which the person is engaged. As the old saying goes, clothes make the man. 
This refers to judging a man according to how he looks and treating him accordingly. So when we see a man in clericals and judge, by which I mean know or understand what he is, and we see that he is a priest, the appropriate response is respect and honor. There's an important distinction between ordinary or everyday clothes and special or official clothes. I give the example here of a married couple rushing off to a fast food restaurant for a quick lunch. They wear street clothes, jeans, sweatshirt, sneakers, and of course their wedding rings. The wedding rings signify their status as married and the clothes signify they're not doing anything special. They're just having a quick lunch. But the same couple on their wedding day were dressed differently. The bride wore a white gown with a veil and satin shoes. The groom wore a tuxedo and highly polished shoes. Neither wore wedding rings at the beginning of the ceremony, but after the ceremony, they both did. They wore special clothes, clothes that I refer to as official clothes on that day because they were changing their status and they added important ornamentation, their wedding rings that again signify they're married. Like lay people, the status of the clergy and the activities they are engaged in is revealed by the clothes and the ornamentation that they wear. Their everyday clothes, those that are not worn during, liturg during liturgies and during services are called clericals or in some case seculars. These distinctive clothes identifies them as clergy. When we see a man in a black suit with a black tab collar shirt or a black cassock, we know he is a member of the clergy, even though we do not know if he's from an order, a rite, or perhaps a Protestant denomination. So those clothes identify him for what he is. And that's very important. You know, I often use the example, if I'm in a car accident and I see somebody running towards me, uh, I want it to be someone in a black suit with a white tab collar, just in case I'm on the way out. I don't, uh, you know, and I think that that's, you know, something important that we should all realize. When we see these men dressed this way, they're letting you know they're approachable. And if you need help, you can go to them. Clericals in the early centuries of Christianity, uh, clerics didn't wear clericals. Uh, the article in uh, Catholic Encyclopedia that I referenced, clerical costume, itemizes multiple sources which point to the lack of, lack of distinctive clothes. For some time, clerics wore the same clothes as the laity, probably hundreds of years. Here is the one from the article that impressed me. So Thurston wrote, the most explicit testimony that is, uh, is that afforded by a letter by Pope Celestine in 428 to certain bishops of Gaul, in which he rebukes them for wearing attire which made them conspicuous and lays down the rule, and I'm quoting, that we, the bishops and clergy, should be distinguished from the common people by our learning, not by our clothes, by our conduct, not by our dress, by cleanliness of mind, not by the care we spend upon our person. So this Pope, and um, you know, this was in 428, so for uh, over 400 years, uh, there was a desire in the church that popes wore the same clothes as every, uh, popes that priests wore the same clothes as everybody else. They shouldn't be isolated out by having better clothes or different clothes. For quite some time, clerics did wear the same clothes as, clarity, as the laity, and the change to distinctive clothing probably started around the sixth century. So the, um, the letter that I quoted 428, so within 75 to 100 years, it started to change. From the same article in the sixth and following centuries, we find that in Rome and in countries near Rome, the civil dress of the clergy began markedly to differ from that of the laity. 
the reason probably being that the former adhered to the old Roman type of custom with its long tunic and cloak representing the toga, whereas the laity were increasingly inclined to adopt the short tunic with breeches and mantle. The Northern barbarians, which is what they actually called them, uh, who were now the masters of Italy, had this kind of clothing, the short tunic, the breech, breeches and the mantle. Probably this Roman influence made itself felt by some extent throughout Western Christianity. In countries that are not close to Rome, the distinctive clothing developed later and in different styles. So what that basically tells us is that the clerics weren't trying to look different. They were wearing the same clothes as they had always worn, but the popular culture changed and with that, the clothing changed. So they continued to wear long tunics and uh, cloaks, whereas the majority of people in the area were wearing short tunics with breeches and a mantle. So um, again, that's in the, uh, in the fifth century. Clericals today vary by location, position in the church, rights, and order. Um, I wish uh, that I had gotten interested in this professionally uh, when I was um, studying theology and at uh, Dominican House of Studies studying for my licentiate, um, because I think that I would have gone into this uh, in much more detail. To try to understand vestments, the history of it, I mean, I'm only touching upon some of the factors. This is stuff that could not be covered in a course. I think it would have to be covered in several courses or perhaps even um, at the master's level, you know, where we require uh, quite a few uh, courses in your um, specific area. There's a lot to learn, but here at least, we're going, to start, uh, we're going to start by looking at some of the commonalities. So black, as we know, is the standard color for clericals. Father William Saunders, in his very nice article, Why Do Priests Always Wear Black? He states that black is a color of mourning arid death for the priest. The symbolism is dying to oneself to rise and serve the Lord as well as giving witness to the kingdom yet to come. This witness is important today in our very secular world. As a reminder, there is someone and something to live for that is eternal and that we do not live on earth forever. When we die, we want to spend eternity with the Lord. The specific type of clerical a man is wearing will usually identify his rank. Returning to the Saunders article, he gives the example of the appropriate cassocks to be worn by rank in the church. <coughs> Excuse me. Just last night, I received an email from a co-professor um, who is uh, the head of the sacred art department for uh, the bachelors. And she was writing to me about how many different kinds of cassocks there are in Italy. And uh, so here we're only going to cover the ordinary Roman cassock, but be aware that it's not just vestments that are um, uh, of multiple variety, but also um, cassocks and other clericals. So the color of the ordinary Roman cassock and clerical attire is in general black. For the regular parish priest, the cassock is totally black. For cardinals, the buttons, trim, and inside hem are scarlet silk. For patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, prelates of honor, the buttons, trim, and inside hem are amaranth red. And for the chaplains to the Holy Father, purple. For liturgical and public ceremonies of the church, cassocks are of one color. White for the Holy Father, scarlet for cardinals, purple for patriarchs, archbishops, bishops, and prelates of honor, and black for priests. In some dioceses, especially in the tropics, I mean, obviously black makes you hot in hot weather, uh, permission is granted for the cassocks to be white, and then they're trimmed in the color, designating the status of the cleric. The cassock or soutane 
is defined by Collins as a plain, lightweight, ankle-length garment with long sleeves but no hood. That's now. Keep in mind that in the past, uh, it traveled, it had variety, you know, it had no sleeves, it had a hood, um, it had a collar. So, I mean, there's been a lot of evolution here. Of the clericals, the symbolism of the cassock is deeply beautiful. Saunders writes, the Roman collar symbolizes obedience, the sash or cincture around the waist, chastity, and the color black, poverty. In our very secular world, the wearing of clerical garb continues to be a visible sign of belief and of the consecration on one's life to the service of the Lord and his church. Now, I'd like to point out, uh, again, as an aside, I have seen this, but not only with priests. I was in, um, uh, I was in Costco and uh, doing some shopping, and four or five older sisters in full habit walk by. You know, they're pushing their little carts, and, you know, they're happy. You know, you can see they're happy. They've got big smiles on their faces. And people saw them, and they were stopping, and they were saying, hi, sister, hi, sister, you know. And it was like, you know, there's respect there. So, you know, if you just see five older women walking through the store, like Costco, and being an old woman, I can uh, attest to this, you're not going to get that response. <laughs> but as a sister, you know, in full habit, there's such respect. It was, it was really an eye opener for me in our very secular world that seeing these women had such an impact on strangers in a big warehouse store. Anyway, back to my cassock story. Note also that the Roman cassock, which is the only cassock I'm speaking about, has 33 buttons. This signifies the number of years that Jesus was on earth. As an aside, I have a friend who is a Monsignor. When he loses a button, which he does with amazing regularity, he leaves me with me the cassock to repair. I count from the top of the cassock down um, and uh, try to find out which button is missing. And when I find out, I repair the cassock, imagining what Christ's life would have been at that age. So, for instance, if I find out that button 17 is missing, I try to figure out what would Christ's life have been like when he was 17. There are also five buttons on each sleeve, and they represent the five wounds of Christ, from the nails in his hands and feet, so that's four, and the lance wound to his side. These buttons are of particular interest to me, as I have a devotion to the holy wounds and also to the suffering head. I have to tell you that when I learned about the meeting of the buttons, I had a better sense of what it means when we say the priest puts on Christ. When a priest puts on a cassock, a Roman cassock, he's putting on the years that Christ lived and he's putting on the five holy wounds. I mean, that, is, that just is so beautiful. And the majority of people, I think, are not aware of that. But now you are. Norris offers interesting information on the development of the cassock. He states that some people think the cassock originated from the Cacarella of the Gauls who lived in Northwestern Europe. Norris quotes Dio Cassius, who described uh, the cassock as a sleeve tunic made somewhat in the fashion of a corselet. It was open in the front. It was open in the front and had a slit in the back. By the third century, the Emperor Marcus Aurelius Antonius Bassianus wore the caracalla, whose nickname became caracalla because of the garment. The emperor lengthened it from knee length to ankle length and made it tighter. Eventually, it became popular for the Romans to wear. And next, wear, I'll, next week, I'll talk about the emperor in more detail uh, and the relationship between the tunic and the alb um, and this emperor. He was uh, quite a character. Uh, not in a good sense. Early church historians refer to the caracalla as worn by clerics in the middle of the fifth century. It is described as a short tunic with sleeves and hood. 
At that time, the tunic was similar to the original design. We don't know when priests started to wear the ankle-length tunic, but by the 11th century, they were, and it was usually black. At that time, it was primarily worn for warmth and was often lined with animal skins, more expensive animal skins for higher prelates and less expensive skins for lower prelates. Remember, it was open in the front and slit in the back. By the 12th century, it was fastened at first by a simple method of strings, although buttons were in use from classical times. So I want to quote what Norris said about this uh, garment, in, about it in the 13th century. So again, the 1200s. A brass, that's a kind of grave marker if you're uh, unaware of it, mostly in Europe, I believe. A brass of a priest of the second half of the 13th century shows him clad in a black cassock lined with fur, which gives a rather bulky effect. The cut is the same as it was previously, but fuller in the sleeves and skirt on account of the fur lining. It was fastened up the front by six pairs of buttons below the waist. These extended upwards, perhaps being covered by the hands. Over the shoulder and the neck are the folds of a detached turned back hood. A narrow stand-up collar appears on cassocks seen in brasses later in that century and in the next, but of course this would be hidden when a hood was worn. By degrees, buttons placed very close together descend the whole length of the front and the black slit was flanked by one and later two pleats led into the waist seam. In more recent times, colored cassocks became customary. Again, as I mentioned earlier, the Pope wore a white one, cardinals, scarlet, archbishops, bishops, and other prelates purple. For ordinary everyday use, cardinals and prelates wore black cassocks, piped, button, and girded with a silk sash or cincture in scarlet and purple, respectively. Black cassocks continued to be worn by priests and minor clergy. Moving on to another kind of uh, clerical, we have the tab collar shirt and Roman collar. According to Collins, it's a type of shirt that has a folded down collar with an opening over the top button over the throat. The shirt has a fly front, that is a flap of cloth that covers the buttons that go down the front. The shirt comes with a white tab that looks something like a tongue depressor, not my definition or description. After putting on the shirt, the wearer slips the tab into place. The effect is a black collar with a white rectangle over the throat. If the white rectangle is wide, it's called an Anglican collar. If it's narrow, it's called a Roman collar. Collins continues, the terms Roman collar or Roman shirt refer to style, not to origin. Clergy shirts are Protestant in origin. The Roman Catholic Church did not adopt them as streetwear for clergy until the 19th century. Father uh, Sam Kabucha, in his YouTube food video, Why Do Priests Wear All Black, um, said something that I thought was very significant. He said he likes wearing the white. He says the white, which signifies purity and light, covers his throat. So he hopes the words he uses will always be pure and a light to other people. Um, so I thought that was, uh, I thought that was very nice. Also like lay people, the clergy wear special or official clothing, which are called vestments. Lang's definition is the form of liturgical dress worn by members of the clergy during official priestly duties and religious ceremonies, such as the mass processions, the sacraments, and the blessings of objects of persons. Collins differentiates between the two and that clericals are street clothes while vestments are only worn during worship. Collins later states they are worn by the clergy when they are attending or presiding over a liturgical event. So next week, uh, I will start talking about um, the uh, vestments. The amount of information on them is enormous Again, too much to cover even in a full college course. But in this MOOC, at least we will introduce vestments 
in the ordinary form of the Latin uh, in the ordinary form of the Roman rite in the Latin ritual family. Okay, so that kind of narrows it down. But remember that the history and development of uh, vestments, even within just that ritual family, within that rite, is uh, enormous. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tulin Wilson, for your presentation. Sure. Uh, at this time, we can entertain uh, questions. In, mm -hmm. um, if anyone has one, simply unmute yourself and uh, feel free to ask. Well, I've got one that's an icebreaker. <coughs> mm -hmm. um, so wh what do you think uh, Jesus was doing at age 17? <laughs> I think he was learning obedience from his parents. And um, I think he was... Uh, just developing well, uh, loving his, uh, his father in heaven. He was always aware that he was God uh, or is God. Uh, so it wasn't a surprise to him. Unlike uh, there were heresies, of course, who say that when he was baptized, that's when he found out he was God and he discovered it. We know that's not true. So, I mean, he was probably just... Um, you know, enjoying life uh, as a 17 year old and uh, learning um, obedience from his parents and uh, doing what he could to help people and, uh, you know, communicating daily um, with the father. But uh, that, was, that was so nice, you know. Um, I jokingly say Monsignor lost buttons all the time, he really did. You know, and it's like I'd always look forward to it because it was my own little thing. You know, it's like I'll count down how many buttons, you know, and then I'll try to figure out what he was doing. I mean, like when he was two, he was probably just starting to stagger around walk, you know. And so it really it really uh, as someone who's had children, it's something that gives you a um, it gives you a different sense of the Lord. Uh, anyone else? Uh, Claire Grace. Yeah. Hi, doctor. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you. Um, I have a question, something that's been kind of um, bothering me for a couple of years. Um, I, I teach, I teach vestments. Um, oh, yeah, I nice. actually, I teach, I actually start the school year out and I, um, I actually own my own set of vestments um, nice. for um, every yeah. Right, for teaching. And I got authorization from our pastor to go ahead and do that. I went to the diocesan warehouse and I have it all, as the saying goes. And one of the things, though, that got me was in the cassock or the soutane. Um, I, every year I get access to a uh, past bishop of our diocese who has since passed away but left his cassocks to the family. And the family, um, they, lend them to me to bring it in but i'm a little bit baffled by this particular bishop's cassock because it came from gamarelli um mm -hmm. in rome who does all that um all the work in in making vestments and mm -hmm. you know, cassocks and all that and every year i'm i'm so stunned because the whole thing is made from gamarelli and it's so perfect and so beautiful but the five there are no buttons the five mm. buttons and it's a folded back the sleeve on the sleeve on it is folded back mm -hmm. so and i i looked at it and there are no buttons on any mm -hmm. of on either of the the sleeves but yet the 33 buttons are um, down the front yeah. are down the yeah. front is there something that that i don't know why those five mm -hmm. buttons wouldn't be on each of the sleeves well, the uh, Roman cassock is one kind of cassock, and that is uh, the kind that I was describing. I don't know if every cassock has five buttons. I don't, you know, so I was only talking about that particular kind. But right. it's certainly an interesting question, and I can research that and get back okay. to you next week. Right, you know, because so. I actually don't bring it up, and yet the kids recognize it every year. Yes. When that yeah. comes in, they they yeah. they hone right in on where are the five buttons on the sleeves, and I, I and I have to go. I, I don't know, um, but it would be kind of cool to start next year's school year out okay. and be able yeah. to tell them why those five buttons are actually missing on each of the sleeves. Yeah, yeah. So I will certainly look into that this week, and okay. uh, I'll make sure I get back to you on it. 
it's, uh, but as I said, I know that there's very many different kinds um, and they have evolved over time. So it could be that something that was made decades ago would have, you know, had some kind of different because of Vatican II. Uh, um, it so was actually 1960. Okay. Because we okay. became our, we're, I'm from the Diocese of Allentown, and we mm -hmm. had originally been Archdiocese of Philadelphia, but okay. in 1960, um, John the 23rd granted Bishop McShea mm -hmm. the right to have our own diocese, and it's actually Bishop McShea's cassock. Okay. And, and he actually, what, while he was in Rome getting all the paperwork and everything started mm -hmm. for our diocese, he actually had he had this cassock made by Gamarelli, which I bring it in because I also teach about Gamarelli mm -hmm. as well. And Gamarelli, actually, Stefano made me little miniature like Berettas uh -huh. in all the different colors, and I bring yeah. them into class. So uh -huh. um, I would just love to know why that particular cassock does not have those. But and, and you can even tell it's not like they came off. There right. is no yeah. puncture marks or anything. Yeah, yeah. yeah you'd be able to tell. Um, so yeah, so I'll get back to you next week. Thanks. Awesome. Okay. Anyone else? The comments, Cynthia, this is fabulous. You know, being a cradle Catholic, all these little details uh, just open your mind and your heart, mm -hmm. uh, especially the buttons. Uh, look at Claire Grace's students remembering, mm -hmm. you know, the five buttons, the wounds. Yeah. And I think you're, um, you know, you're what you shared with us about the uh the contemplation on the years of his life i think that's yeah, incredibly yeah. beautiful thank so you. thank you i have no questions i'm just enjoying this very much thank you well, thank you thank you it's been a, a long uh, as i said it's 45 years since i first saw vestments mm -hmm. and i was fascinated but you remember david wilcox i'm sure Ab absolutely yeah yeah and he was such a holy man and uh he really you know he awakened me that i was just looking at the beauty, but I mm -hmm. had to look through it, past it, mm -hmm. to where it was pointing. And that was just such a significant moment, mm -hmm. you know, just to, you know, just standing there talking to, you know, to this guy I'm friendly with. And it's like, bam, you know, he changes my whole perspective. It was wonderful. You know. okay. uh, any other questions? What about, what about comments? Uh, does anybody have any uh, experience or any reflections that they'd like to share? Well, that's a good idea. Yeah. Just uh, to go along with the sisters, uh, you know, the visible sign. Of course, our oh, sisters yes. here at Holy Apostles all, all wear their oh, yes. habits. Mm -hmm. uh, um, but um, I remember a story about a priest being in, in uh, the airplane and people were turning around and asking him questions, which you sure. wouldn't do to an ordinary person because it's like they're opening themselves up by wearing their clericals, by saying, this is who I am, I am, you know, yes. come, come and meet me. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a, a beautiful testament, you know, it is. to their, to their it vocation. Is. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's always heartwarming to me. Um, that's one of the things I enjoy about being at Holy Apostles. I mean, you know, it's, it's not just the sisters. I mean, like, um, you know, you see the, the priests walking around, um, you know, they're, you know, they're, they're just all so clearly, um, so clearly in love, you know, that they wear these clothes and it's just an uh, outward sign, you know, it's, it's really beautiful, you know, so. I, I've never, I've never actually asked one of the, I guess the deacons are the first ones to start to wear clericals, correct? Mm -hmm. uh, I've never asked them how they felt when they first received their new garment. Mm -hmm. You know, that would, that would be an interesting interview or yeah. a question next time I meet one, yeah. you know, yeah. for the first Do time. Yeah, for next week. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah, but it's, uh, you know, I'm very, I'm very proud when I see um, all of these people walking around. I mean, there's a lot of students there and they're all dressed the way they should be. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it's uplifting. Sure. You know, so, but yeah. I see we have Dan D'Amelio with us, and he's one of our students. Now you're you're a deacon now, right, Dan? Dan? That's correct. I am a permanent deacon. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. That three years ago. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, just thinking about when I was vested, that was just overwhelming. Really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I would imagine. And, um, yeah. And, uh, mm -hmm. 
you know, you get, you get as a deacon, you get to choose who's going to vest you. Mm -hmm. So I had a priest that had, I had known for, for quite a while. And so that mm -hmm. was, you know, made it even more special. Sure. But, um, yeah. But mm -hmm. as, as a deacon now, I, I only wear my, um, uh, my alb and my stole. I don't have any dalmatics. Mm -hmm. A lot of deacons do have dalmatics. Yes. That they wear. yes, yes. And next week I talk about the deacons. So yep. actually, if you're coming next week, if you could um, just show us your vestments. Sure, that, I could do that. That would be nice. Yeah. I'll uh, particularly show you the one that my wife made for me. It's a Marian mm -hmm. uh, stole. Oh, nice, nice. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Say hello to her. I haven't seen her in years. I will. Except it's Facebook. good to see you, Doctor. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. Thank you. You bet. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, so I've got a, a question. The uh, seminary where I first uh, was employed, uh, Kendrick Glennon Seminary in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I remember there was a time uh, where uh, the seminarians were not allowed to wear their clerics off campus. Yes. On this campus, they had to take their clerics. Uh, they had to wear street clothes. Yeah, it was the same here at Holy Apostles. There was a time when they couldn't wear anything uh, off campus except regular lay clothes. What was the was reason? A long time. You know, I never, I never found out. But that, that is something that we should. It should be easy enough to find out. That was. Uh, oh well, how long have you worked here now? Fourteen years or so. Oh, uh, ten years. Uh, Eleven years here. Okay. And, or 10 years yes. here and uh, 12 years at uh, Kendrick Glenn Seminary. Yeah, so it's probably, you know, if we look back 15 years, uh, it would tell us. Because even in class, they weren't wearing them. Now, I came in, um, I came to teach in 98. Is that right? No, I came to teach in 97. And when I came, of course, there were a lot of... Um, you know, young males, <laughs> I don't think maybe one or two sisters, I don't, not many. And um, I remember seeing them all dressed in their clericals, but not most of the time, you know, so it was like, it was just kind of interesting to see that they wouldn't even wear habits, nothing, they wear regular lay clothes. So but I don't know what the reason was, but it stopped after I don't know, it was probably in the mid-teens, maybe 2014, 15, I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, they, uh, they were, none of them were wearing uh, clericals unless it was something official. Um, for a time, we had, uh, uh, who is now Cardinal Burke, uh, back when uh, he was Archbishop Burke of St. Louis, uh, he required the students uh, not only to wear uh, clerics, but to wear their cassocks. Mm. Uh, and I thought that was interesting, you know, the uh, the move to an even more formalized uh, form of dress. I, mm -hmm. At least uh, that's what it seemed to me, that the classic is a more formal form of dress. Mm -hmm. than the cleric. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, I do not know what the reason was, but uh, the minute you said that, I remembered how it had been at Holy Apostles years and years ago. Um, so at least from 97, probably even before that, and I don't know, it was probably 2014, 2015 before uh, they started to wear the, the uh, clericals. So, and I mean, even the men who were in orders, they wouldn't wear the habits. They'd have regular clothes on. So I don't, I don't know what, the, uh, what was going on there, but to know that it happened at another seminary would tell me that it's more of a movement that, or something within the church. Uh, than I was aware of at that time. Any other questions? Well, thank you for making time for uh, uh, for sharing with us your wisdom about this uh, subject. Uh, for uh, everyone uh, who's here, uh, please know we're going to do this uh, for the next four Wednesdays. Do you have any uh, final thoughts or uh, summary comments, Dr. Tulin Wilson, before we uh, have our closing prayer? Well, the thing that I think is most important, um, apart from an awareness of the, um, the incredible variety and how you could spend a whole program, you know, a whole college program learning these things, is to realize the significance of what they mean. Uh, and again, I go back to the example of looking at things that are beautiful and then looking at things that are beautiful and understanding what they mean. 
I think that's extremely important. It's nice to see, um, you know, it's nice to see people dressed in their clericals. Uh, it's wonderful when you see the men in their vestments when you're uh, at mass, but it's also that it's not just beauty, it's more. And uh, I think that's a very significant message. And one that I learned a uh, long time ago from one of my students. <laughs> So I do see that we have a, a priest here, Father Raymond. Would you like to close us in prayer? In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for giving us a gift of the opportunity to serve you in the royal priesthood, but especially for giving us the gift of the ministerial priesthood, for giving us men who are able to serve you faithfully and configure into Christ to bring your son also through the Eucharist to all the people, to bring them the sacraments, healing, and your presence. I ask you, Lord, to bless everyone here, that we might be able to, through these courses, recognize your grace and always come closer to you through what we learn about you, through your church, and the symbolism, the rich symbolism that we have in this Catholic faith. Almighty God bless you and keep you all, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. All right, everybody. We'll see you uh, same time, same channel next week. God bless. Take care. Bye-bye.